I wasn't going to share much this morning about this, but um, I just think I need to because you're my church family. And if you don't normally attend here, you'll uh, just bear with me just for a quick moment. Um, many of you know my father-in-law. He's 89, was a minister for many years, and he's in the last stages of his life. This morning, my wife and kids are with him. And uh, so we need your prayers today. It's hard to get up here and do this this morning. And uh, it's difficult. And the subject the Lord gave me today is really difficult uh, to share. But uh, we received, I just got a text before I stepped on stage. And doctors came in and said that, that the only thing keeping him alive on this earth are the machines and the medicine at this point. And he's just ready to transition over. And uh, he's ready. Well, it's hard to let people go, isn't it? And uh, difficult. But we're not the only people going through things this morning and hard times and difficult times. We're in a room full of people who are going through some difficult times and hard things in life. Gail, we laid your mother to rest this past week. And this past Saturday, a week ago, we laid one of our church members to rest. It's a natural part of life that we go through difficult times together. I don't know how people do it without a church family. Honest, do not know how people do it without a church family. To support them and love them, pray for them, be there for them, how difficult it is. But I just want to have a prayer this morning. And this is not a prayer for the Atkins family. This is a prayer for anybody here this morning who may be going through something. If there's something in your life that you're going through, it could be the loss of a loved one. It could be a sickness. It could be a financial need. It could be a marital problem. It could be a problem in your family. If you're just going through something, I'm just going to ask you to stand with me this morning if you would. Just, just stand. Don't, don't be ashamed of it. Just stand. <laughs> Pretty good. A little over only half of us going through something in here this morning. And if you're seated, let me just promise you this. You'll be going through something soon enough. It'll happen. Man, thank God for the moments everything's good. Thank God for those moments. If you feel comfortable doing this, would you reach over and take the person's hand beside of you? Maybe you know that person, maybe you don't know that person, but if you feel comfortable doing that, we just pray for each other this morning. You don't even have to know what the need is, what's going on. Could we just offer a prayer? And we believe our God is so big and so awesome and so powerful, He can hear every prayer at the same time. And He can decipher them and He knows what to do and how to work and how to answer. So could you pray with me for that person beside of you? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you right now. I pray for every person under the sound of my voice that is going through a difficult moment in their life, in their family, in their finances, in their marriage, in their health, whatever it may be. Father, we pray right now that you will do a miraculous work in them and through them today. Lord, before this service is completed this morning, that you will move in a mighty and a powerful way, that you will restore what the enemy has taken away from us, that you will give back better than what we had before in our lives. Lord, we stand upon the word of God today that we are not alone, that we are not by ourselves, that we are not left to just fend for ourselves, but that we believe that you are with us through everything that we face in this life. I pray for every person standing right now. I pray for everyone watching us online right now who is going through something in their life. Strengthen, touch, heal, restore in Jesus name in Jesus name thank you father amen and amen God bless you this morning thank you for standing thank you for praying you may be seated sometimes you just need to know that you're not by yourself 
that you've got somebody with you. And I'm going to tell you, if you're looking for a church home, this church home will love you and pray for you and support you in any way that they can. And that we'll be there for you in the good and the bad and everything else that life may throw at you. Well, if you're watching us on Facebook this morning and you have a prayer request, a prayer need, please put that in our comment section and we'll add you to our prayer list for this coming week and we'll begin to pray with you for that need in your life. If you want to grab your bulletin and turn to your sermon notes page, we're just going to jump right into 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to be talking about verses 1 through 13 this morning. We won't read every verse, but we'll be talking about them at some point throughout our time together this morning. I want to begin by asking you a very... Um, simple, but a very direct question this morning. And it's simply this. How will I be remembered when I die? How will I be remembered when I die? After you're dead and gone, after you have lived your 50 or 60 or 70, 80 or 90 or maybe even plus years. When your time on this earth has come to an end, how are you going to be remembered? What will your story be? What is the legacy that you will leave behind? When people talk about you when you leave this life, if they talk about you at all, what are they going to say about you? And let me sharpen that question just a little bit more this morning. What will the people who knew you the best say about you when you are gone? We all know that casual acquaintances can say whatever they want to say, and it really doesn't matter what somebody who just casually knew you has to say about you. Because they never really knew you at all. They were just a casual acquaintance. But you cannot fool your spouse, and you cannot fool your children, and you cannot fool your parents, and you cannot fool your closest friends. They know the truth about us because they have lived with us for so long, and they have seen us in so many different circumstances. What will those people who know you the best, who have known you the longest, who know you the most intimately, what will those individuals say about you? as they walk back to their automobiles from the cemetery and your casket is being lowered into the ground, how will you be remembered? This may seem like a morbid question to even ponder and think about in our day and age in which we live in because none of us really like to think about our mortality. And yet in church we sing about it and preach about it and talk about mortality and eternal life for all the time. That's what we talk about in church. And as we look at Paul's writings in 2 Timothy chapter 2, we realize that Paul is asking the same question, and yet it is not an idle question that he is asking. See, prior to writing this letter, what we call the second letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy, Paul had been arrested and in prison for about two years. During that first imprisonment, it was relatively light imprisonment. He had lots of freedom, and he could do certain things in the prison, and it was uh, difficult, yes, but yet it wasn't as hard as it could have been. And you read about that in Acts chapter 28, about two years in prison, then he is released, and then sometime later, Paul is rearrested. And it is in this second arrest that Paul writes this letter to Timothy that we now call Second Timothy, his second letter to Timothy. Again, he finds himself in prison, in Rome, in chains. But this time it's a little bit different. He is under the sentence of imminent death. He has a death sentence that has been placed upon him. And Paul knew that as he's writing this letter to Timothy that his days are numbered and they are quickly evaporating. And his ultimate death, according to church history, is that he will be beheaded. Paul knows that he will never get out of this prison. And that's why he writes in 2 Timothy 4 and 7 something that we read at almost every believer's funeral. I have finished my course. He knew he was not going to get out of this one alive. So he says, I have finished my course. You see, for Paul, the race of life was almost over. 
And so there was only one thing to do in his mind, and that was to send a message to his young son in the faith, Timothy, and give him a final word of encouragement. Then he could face his death with grace and with courage. If you think about the Apostle Paul and how he is remembered today, here is a man about to be put to death by the Roman emperor Nero at that time. According to history, he was a sadistic madman. But we have here in this time, Nero, the most powerful man in the world, and Paul, a simple Jewish preacher who was a follower of Jesus Christ. And now more than 2,000 years have passed, and what does the world say about Nero and about Paul? One writer said it this way, and I think it really sums it up. Men now named their dogs Nero, and they named their sons Paul. A lot of truth in that, isn't it? So here is Paul's advice to young Timothy. He says, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Samuel Johnson once said that when a man knows he will be hanged in the fourth night, it concentrates his mind wonderfully. When you know death is imminent, your mind becomes laser-focused on what's going on and what's going to happen and what you need to say and why you need to say it. And so Paul knows he's not going to get out of this prison alive. He knows he has a death sentence on him. He knows, yes, I will most likely be beheaded. And so I must get this message to my son in the faith, Timothy. I must tell him some things that I need him to know for his life. Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, there's two things that you need to do before you die. And I could just say that these are two things that you and I need to do in our own lives before we die as well. First, he tells him to be strong in the Lord. And then he tells him to pass his faith along. Timothy, I need you to be strong in the Lord. You're my son in the faith. I need you to be strong in the Lord. And next, I need you to pass your faith along as well. This is what we must do. This is our calling. This is our challenge. This is our mission from God as well. Be strong in the Lord. When times are tough, Paul would say be strong. When you feel like giving up, and who hasn't ever felt like giving up at some point in life? When you feel like giving up, Paul says be strong. In the face of unrelenting opposition, stand your ground and be strong. To be strong means that you don't rely on yourself when times are tough, but it means that you rely on the Lord alone. Amen. And there is one specific piece of advice that Paul gives Timothy. What I have taught you, you must now teach others. In other words, Paul says, pass your faith along. First, be strong, because if you aren't strong, you can't pass anything along. But if you will be strong now, I want you to take the faith you have, and I want you to pass it on to somebody else. Notice what Paul says. Entrust the truth to reliable people. Entrust the truth to reliable people. And why does that matter? Why does that statement ring out to us this morning? Because we are to teach everyone that we can. But Paul hammers down a little bit deeper with that statement, teach it to reliable people. Because we must seek out people who are trustworthy and who are faithful and invest in those kinds of people. Yes, we teach everybody. Yes, we talk about faith to everybody. But Paul says, in your life, Timothy, and in our lives as believers, we find those people who are faithful, 
who are trustworthy, and we begin to pour ourselves into their lives. Let me just say this morning that you cannot pour yourself into everybody because everybody is not trustworthy and everybody is not faithful. And the longer I serve God and the longer I've been a minister and a pastor, the more I realize that I've got to pick out individuals that I can pour myself into who are faithful and trustworthy to carry on the faith that I have. Because everybody's not trustworthy and everybody's not faithful. We find reliable people and we pour ourselves into them. And then they are qualified to teach others. I find it very amazing as you read this passage in 2 Timothy that Paul really mentions four generations, we could call it, in this passage. The first generation is Paul. Paul talks about himself. The second generation is Timothy. He talks about the son in the faith, Timothy. The third generation are those reliable people that we pour ourselves into. And the fourth generation are the others that we have taught. Paul mentions four generations of people in this passage. We would call this the principle of spiritual multiplication. It's when I pour myself into reliable people. Can I just say this morning that spiritual multiplication is the only way to reach a world whose population now exceeds six billion people. Spiritual multiplication. Addition will not get the job done. What is addition? Addition is, is it depends on me and me alone. And the only people who will be reached are the people I can talk to myself. But I'm only one person. And I'm limited by time and by space and by energy and by opportunity. And so to make a real difference in this world, we must practice spiritual multiplication. And what does that look like? Well, I'm going to come off the stage and get on the floor in the dark and the camera, people won't like it, but I'm going to do it anyway. This is what spiritual addition looks like. Brother Michael, come here and just stay here with me. Spiritual addition just means I talk to whoever I can talk to when I have an opportunity, as I have the time, as I have the energy, and so I add this person. But it may take a long time to add that person and a lot of energy. Jason, come here. Maybe if I'm fortunate, I have enough time in my schedule to add another person. I say, now I'm going to invest in this person and pour into this person and, and help this person. But it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. Now I've got two people I'm trying to invest in and trying to pour into. Daniel, can you come up for a second? Maybe by some wild stretch of the imagination, I've got just a little bit of energy left, and I pour into a third person, and I talk to him, and I help teach him, and I help give him what God's given me. And I've taken all this time and all this energy, and I may have added three people. That's spiritual addition. But here's what spiritual multiplication looks like. I want you guys to go get somebody. I don't know who they're going to get. Y'all just come up here. Just go and grab somebody. There was three, right? Now how many are there? Six. That is spiritual multiplication. Don't know why the body of Christ is suffering and, and becoming depleted? It's because we're trying to build the body and invest in the body by simple addition. But addition doesn't work when you're trying to save six billion people in the world. What works is multiplication. You six go get six more. Yeah. Each of you grab somebody.
Now, how many are there? Too many to count almost, right? Because now you got to do your addition to see how many people I got up here. You see what's happened? I've gone from addition to multiplication. This is the principle of spiritual multiplication. And this is what Paul is trying to teach to his young son in the faith, Timothy. Timothy, you cannot do this by yourself. I don't care how young you are, how strong you are, how much time you think you have. You have got to find people who are faithful, who are trustworthy, and you pour into them. And then they go out and they find people who are faithful, who are trustworthy, and they pour into them. And then they go out and they find faithful and trustworthy people, and they pour into them. And that is a principle of spiritual multiplication, not spiritual addition, spiritual multiplication. Let me just ask you a strange question this morning. Who are you pouring into right now? Who are you pouring into? I know the answer for most believers is they're not pouring into anybody. They're not taking what they have and passing it on to anyone. It stays within themselves. So to help us learn how to become spiritual multipliers, thank you, everybody. I know y'all didn't plan on doing this today. I want to give you a little acronym that is simply this. I want you to go out and find some people who are fat. There are lots of jokes I could put here, and lots of things I could say, but I will not incriminate myself. Fat stands for faithful, available, and teachable. Find some fat people in your life. Find some people who are faithful. Find some people who are available. And find some people who are teachable, that you can take what God has poured into you and you can pour it into somebody else's life and begin the process of spiritual multiplication. Many of you here today have been in church for years and years. You have a wealth of knowledge that you could pass on to the younger generation, but sadly, many of you will die with that knowledge, never having passed it on to anyone else. And it is not just here, but this idea of it is my knowledge and my wisdom and my know-how that is rampant within the body of Christ. I personally know pastors that will not offer advice to other pastors because of fear and pride. As a pastor, I never want to be guilty of that. When a pastor wants to talk to me about a building and building a new facility, I will do my best to help that pastor. And I could care less if his building is bigger or better than my building is because it is about pouring into others so that the message of salvation can be multiplied over and over and over again. That's what it's all about. Let me give you a crazy example. A pastor comes to my office one day a few years ago. He says, Pastor Atkins, people come and visit my church, but I can't track them and I can't keep up with them. And that little card in your seat back in front of you, we call it our connection card, I said, what are you doing to connect people? He said, well, he pulled this little card out that he had, I mean, tiny little card, and this is what we use. I said, come with me to the church. We came over here. We turned the lights on just like this. And I said, I want you to experience what people experience in our building. And I said, I want you to sit in that seat where you're seating, Jason, and I want you to fill your card out, and then I want you to fill my card out. And I want you to see which one is easier to fill out. That's pretty basic, isn't it? His tiny little card, which you can barely see the lines, or this big card where everything was spread out nicely. And you know what we did? We gave him cards, and we gave him the template, and I think we even gave him some paper to print them on, if I'm not mistaken. 
And so take what we have and use it. It's yours. It's not ours. But I could have said, I don't care if you can't keep people. Maybe they'll come to my church and be a part of my church. We'll take them. You don't need them. It's not about that. It's about saving people and winning people to Jesus Christ, no matter what it takes to help somebody else do that. I think sometimes that we have heard the same messages for so long that the words of the message begin to lose their effectiveness. I'm guilty of that, just like you may be guilty of that. But these are difficult days in many places around the world. And I believe that hard times are probably already here, but they are most definitely coming to North America if they're not here yet. I have no doubt that moral conditions will continue to decline in America. In fact, in just the last several years, you and I have seen things legal, legalized that our parents and grandparents could never have conceived possible would be legal in this nation. And so Paul warns Timothy in his letter, there will be terrible times in the last days. I don't know whether you know it or not, but things are getting pretty terrible in our world. Just look around you, it's getting pretty terrible. And so in verses 3 through 7 of 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul gives us three examples of people who suffered or have hard times after he asked Timothy in the NIV, it says, join with me in my suffering. In the King James, it says, endure hardship. So Timothy, I want you to endure hardship with me or I want you to join with me in my suffering. First, he says, I want you to think about a soldier. He says, like a good soldier of Christ Jesus, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Paul says the soldier suffers. When Paul wrote this, a Roman soldier who enlisted had to enlist for 20 years. That was the enlistment time period. You enlisted for 20 years. You were not supposed to get married during that 20-year period. Now, they had brothels set up all around that part of the world, but you were not supposed to get married during that 20-year time frame. And if you were a soldier in this time, your survival rate was about 50%. So Paul says a soldier suffers. And he says they don't get entangled in the civilian affairs because he is trying to please his commanding officer. Paul's not saying that we don't care about what's going on in our government. Paul's not saying we should not vote. He's not saying we shouldn't be up on the issues. In fact, I think if my memory is right, Tuesday is election day in our country. Paul would say, if you were here today, go out and vote. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. And I would say, go vote like a Christian on a vote. That's what I would say. But Paul says, don't get so caught up in the civilian affairs, the affairs of this world, that you forget about what is really most important. Now, I'm just going to say this. I've heard more Christians talk about President Trump and the Senate and, and the House and what's going on here and what's going on there. They spend more time talking about politics than they've ever spent talking about Jesus Christ and sharing their faith with anybody. Right. And they get all jacked up and excited and mad about politics, but you can't hardly get them to talk about Jesus. And that's what Paul's saying. Don't get so caught up in the world and what's going on because the Bible says this world is passing away. Amen. It's going to be burnt up one day and gone. But there is a heavenly home, we sing about it today, with streets of gold and gates of pearl, and the sun will always be shining. Focus on that home. Focus on it. And then Paul says, think about the athlete. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. Paul says the athlete suffers. In fact, in Paul's day, the Olympics were held in Rome, and we know the Olympics were a huge deal. He said, think about the athlete who was training for the Olympics. An Olympic athlete had to sign a pledge, had to make an oath that they would commit to 10 months of intense training before they could participate in the Olympic Games. 
had to sign a pledge, had to sign an oath. I will train in this one myself for 10 months before they could participate. Paul says the athlete must discipline himself. He must train and he must play by the rules or else he'll be disqualified. The third one that Paul says suffers is the farmer. So we have a soldier and then we have an athlete and now we have a farmer. And he says a hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. The farmer suffers, Paul says. Because the farmer has to focus on the future. The farmer doesn't just plant a seed, walk away from it, and forget about it. I suppose he could, but he wouldn't reap much from that harvest, would he? No, Paul says the farmer has to plant the seed. He has to weed out the things around the seed. And then he has to wait. You can think of what Paul is saying in these scriptures this way. As soldiers, we must focus on pleasing the Lord. As athletes, we must play by the rules that God has given us. And as farmers, we must work with an eye toward the future. Jesus did not tell us in the Bible, follow me and life will be easy. He didn't tell us that. If some pastor ever told you that, some good-hearted Christian ever told you, if you just follow Jesus, believe you, everything's going to be fine. If you just get saved, everything's going to be fine. I mean, they may have good intentions, but they lied to you. Jesus never said that, did he? He did say this. If you follow me, life will be tough. He did say that. But it will be worth it in the end. Life will be tough, but it's going to be worth it in the end. As we look at the rest of our text this morning, Paul offers us three things that we need to remember as we face these hard and difficult times in life. First, he says, remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. Verse 8, remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. No matter what you're going through this morning, remember Jesus. Sometimes you're going through something so bad and so awful and so hard, and you feel so alone, and you feel so deserted, that you can't even offer a prayer, but you could utter the name Jesus. Jesus. How many times have you ever whispered that name? Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's deliverance in the name of Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. There's victory in the name of Jesus. There's a breakthrough in the name of Jesus. Jesus. Remember Jesus, no matter what you're going through. Secondly, Paul says, remember those who are suffering for their faith. Notice what he says in verses 9 and 10. This is my gospel for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is good for us from time to time to recall those who have paid the high price for believing in Jesus. It is good for us to remember our brothers and sisters around the world and, and countries who are persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. It is good for us to pray for them and to lift them up in any way that we can. Paul says, I am chained, but you cannot chain the gospel. Let me just say this. I try not to get political in the pulpit. So I'll get out of the pulpit. One of our founding church fathers visited a church that didn't believe in ministers wearing ties. And he wore a tie. And they said, we don't let ministers preach in our pulpit who have ties on. And so he said, I won't preach in your pulpit. So he came on the floor and he preached on the floor with his tie on. I don't care what happens Tuesday on election day. Mm -hmm. Hear me out. 
Now, I want you to go vote. I want you to be a good citizen of this land. Now, I don't care who gets elected and what law they try to pass and what they try to do. The gospel cannot be chained. Hallelujah. It cannot be chained. They'll try to chain it, but it can't be chained. The word of God cannot be chained. In fact, Hallelujah. the church, the bride of Jesus Christ, prospers in adversity. Amen. We have our greatest revivals and our greatest growth when there is opposition to the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I say bring it on, devil, because the word of God can't be chained and the gospel can't be chained and revival can't be chained and salvation can't be chained. Legislate all you want to legislate. The word of God is faithful and it is true according to God's word. Can't be changed. And that's my PSA announcement for this morning. <laughs> Third, Paul says, remember my reward. I'm going to remember Jesus when I'm going through difficult times. I'm going to remember others who are suffering for their faith because it makes me realize I'm not the only person suffering here. I'm going to remember my reward. I want to paraphrase quickly what he said in verses 11 through 13. If we die, then we live with him. If we endure through hard times and we never give up, then we reign with him. If we disown him because of cowardice, then we lose our reward. If we are faithful because of doubts or fears or love of the world, he will still be faithful to us because he cannot break his promise. The good news this morning is that the worst our enemies can do to us is kill us. That's the worst they can do to us, is kill us. But if they kill us, we go to heaven. That's what Paul was saying. The worst that can happen to me in this prison is they can kill me. But if they kill me, I get to go to heaven. Where he says, I will live with him forever. That's the worst they can do to me in this Roman prison. Kill me. In other words, Paul is saying, if we lose, we win. If we lose, we win. So go ahead and stand strong. Be bold and live for Christ. Endure hardships and stand up for what you believe in. Because the worst that can happen to you is the best that can happen to you. Because our future as believers in Jesus Christ is secure, not because it rests on us, but because it rests on the faithfulness of God. That's why my future is secure, and that's why yours is secure. So come back to the basic question we started with this morning. How will you be remembered when you die? What are people going to say about you? What kind of person are you? What kind of person do you want to be? What kind of husband are you? What kind of wife are you? What kind of parent are you? What kind of child are you? What kind of mother are you? What kind of father are you? What kind of Christian are you? What kind of Christian do you want to be? One thing that we as followers of Jesus Christ know is that God will call us home when the time comes. My wife told her dad this week, she said, Dad, when you were born, God stamped an expiration date on you. And she said, you're not going to expire a day before. And you won't be here a day after. And the reality is all of us are stamped with an expiration date on us if we believe the word of God. And we believe as followers of Jesus Christ that he will call us home. For some of us, that means that he is going to call us home sooner than others. And others will live many years beyond us. But you can't do anything to cancel death. Death is coming to all of us, whether we're ready or not. Coming to everybody in this room, everybody watching us online this morning, it's going to come to all of us. But I will say this. 
that no one who serves Christ while they are alive will regret it while they're dead. Nobody. I read somewhere something a while back that really made me smile. Because when we leave this world, we often wonder, what about the folks behind us? How are they going to deal with it? What's going to happen to them? Someone wrote these words. When you were born, everyone else was smiling and you were crying. Live so that when you die, everyone else is crying and you're smiling. What a beautiful way to think about it, isn't it? When you were born, everybody was smiling. A new baby, a new baby boy, a new baby girl. And when you leave this world, live your life in such a way. Write your story so beautifully that the people left are going to cry because of the story you wrote. But you'll be smiling because of the life you're living. Let me ask you a question this morning. And I really want you to think about it. What would you want to be written on your tombstone? What would you want? In fact, we're going to do a little exercise this morning. I know I'm 10 minutes after 12, and if you've got to slip out, no hard feelings. I got some guys coming to give you something this morning. And I'm going to participate with you in this. They're going to give you a tombstone. And I want you to think about what you want written on your tombstone this morning. What do you want written on it? Would you say on my tombstone, just write faithful husband, faithful wife. Would you say, right, faithful Christian. Maybe I'd like to have written on my faithful pastor who loved people and did the best he could. I don't know what you want written on your tombstone. And you don't have to show this to anyone this morning. But I just want you to think about your life right now and how you want to be remembered. And what is the story you want people to see through your life and how you lived your life? I promise you this, if you will build your life on Jesus Christ, you will never be disappointed. And those who know you best will be sorry to see you go, but they'll also rejoice with you because they know where you're at. And so in the seat back in front of you, if you don't have a pen already, there are pens in every seat. And I want you just to take a moment, and we're going to pass these out. And I've got uh, people in the sound booth. I've got people in the video room over here. I want everybody to have one. Take some time and think about it. Say, Pastor Atkins, this is a kind of a morbid thing to do on a Sunday morning. I don't think so. In fact, I think the Word of God challenges us to do this. 
challenges us to look at our life, to see how we're living it, to see what we're doing, to see what kind of story we're writing. And as long as there's a breath in your body, it is not too late to change the story. It's not too late to rewrite the story. It's not too late to erase some of those parts with the blood of Jesus Christ and say, that may have been who I was, but now this is who I am. And this is what I want my story to be now going forward. What do you want your story to be? This morning, let me just say again, if you build your life on Jesus Christ, you'll not be disappointed. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. If you're finished writing, would you stand? I just want to close the service this way today. Maybe take your tombstone. You may want to fold it. You may want to see what you wrote on it. That's fine. Here's the prayer this morning. The prayer is simple. God, help me live the life that I wrote on my tombstone. Help me live the life. Help me live it. Maybe you're not living it right now. Maybe there's parts of it you are and there's parts of it that you aren't. But God, from this day forward, I want you to help me start living this life that I've written down this morning. And maybe you tuck this away somewhere and every now and then you pull it out and you just open it up and think, man, I'm missing it. Uh, I'm not writing the story like I want to write it. And you put it back, and then you come back to it a little while later, and you say, you know what? I'm doing pretty good right now. I'm writing that story. I'm writing the story that I wanted to write with my life. What's your story going to be? What's it going to be? So you have your tombstone. I have my tombstone. Let's just close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this congregation and for the love they have for each other. Thank you that they're willing to look at their lives honestly this morning and examine their story I know God this isn't the maybe the most uplifting experience we've done right now but God I think the gospel just makes us from time to time look at our lives sincerely and honestly and challenges us whatever was written on these tombstones this morning Whatever that story is, Father, I pray right now that you would give us the ability and the strength and the desire to begin to live that story, to begin to write that story. Help us to change what needs to be changed and help us to make the corrections that need to be made in our own lives. Help us to look at some things that maybe don't need to be a part of our life right now and to just get rid of those so that we can write this story accurately. Lord, let us be as the Apostle Paul and as we face those difficult times in life, help us to remember you. Help us to remember those who are suffering for their faith. Help us, Lord, to remember that reward that is waiting for us when we're no longer on this earth. I pray you'd help us to be a church of people who are strong believers in you. And I pray you would help us to pass our faith along and begin to, to practice the principle of spiritual multiplication so that we could reach more people the gospel of Jesus Christ. What could be greater said of any of us, Lord, on our tombstones than we were soul winners for Jesus Christ? Well, I pray you would just plant that in everyone listening here today, that they would become a soul winner for you. I pray for someone here today who may not know you as their Savior, who may be unsure about their eternity and where they're going when this life on earth is over. I pray, Holy Spirit, you speak to that heart even now and let them know that they need Jesus Christ in their life as his, their Savior. If you're here and you don't know the Lord, you can pray a very simple prayer. Just say, Dear Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Take them away from me. And you can say simply, I'm, from this day forward, I'm going to serve you the best that I can. If you prayed that prayer, prayer like that, you see me after service, 
and just tell me, Pastor Atkins, I prayed that prayer. And now, Father, I pray blessing upon this congregation, upon everyone listening and watching today. I pray that you be with us throughout this week as we write our story. Let it be a story we're not ashamed to tell and a story we're not ashamed to share. And above all, let our story bring praise and glory and honor to Jesus Christ our Lord. I pray it and ask it all in Jesus' name. And the church says together, amen, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week serving the Lord.